What is the opposite of faithfulness in the Bible? Now, uh, before you th- get smart and think, oh, Eddie, that's easy, just unfaithfulness. Did you know that biblically, the opposite of faithfulness in the Bible is not unfaithfulness? The opposite of faithfulness, biblically, is called adultery, spiritually. Are we faithful to Christ? That is the question we want to address today. Are we faithful? In marriage, it is the same. You are either a faithful spouse or, more than being unfaithful, you have committed adultery. And yes, we like to soften up the sin by calling it an affair or calling it, oh, he was just unfaithful. Sounds a little bit better, doesn't it, than adultery or sin. But let's call it what it is. Something is either good or it is bad. Uh, it is not ungood. You know, if someone were to ask me, how's my singing, Eddie? And I could say, oh, he sings good. You sing ungood? You know? um, it's either good or it is bad. And spiritually, we are married to Jesus Christ when we enter a faith relationship with him, for the church is the bride of Christ. And as the spouse of Christ, we are either faithful to him or we are committing adultery. Those are the only two options. There's no middle ground. So are we faithful to Christ or are we in adultery? How's that for a light introduction? today. But another way that the Bible speaks of faithfulness, and now let's look at the positive side of it, another way that the Bible speaks of faithfulness in a person's life is how they walk or if they walk with the Lord. Uh, Genesis tells that Enoch walked with God and he was no more because God took him away. And also Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. And also Psalm 73, uh, the psalmist writes that my feet almost stumbled, I almost slipped. Again, walking terminology says because I envied the wicked. I envied other people who did not know God. And so in all of these analogies, it is one of walking, of how our steps are orchestrated in walking in fellowship with God. That is how we understand faithfulness biblically. So, because our walk with God is equated with our faithfulness, it's important for us to examine today how we walk, the steps that we take with our feet, both physically and spiritually. So today, we'll be looking at the need to guard our steps, and if necessary, to do some foot surgery to keep us faithful to God. I want to invite you today to open your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 7, and from this week forward, again, we'll see how God leads, but I'll probably, well, from this week, I'll be using the ESV translation, the English Standard Version. Uh, As you know, last year, we've been going back and forth between ESV and NIV, and the more I use it and study with it, I'm falling more and more in love with the ESV translation, so if you do not have an ESV copy, I want to encourage you guys to invest in one. It is much more literal uh, to the original language in its structure. Uh, So I want to encourage you guys to have that available for you as you study the Word of God. We conclude our Extreme Makeover series today. We began by looking at the need for us to have eye surgery, uh, to take sin seriously, that what we look at uh, becomes an influence upon our whole bodies. Also, we looked at heart surgery and the need to have our hearts rest in God alone. And today we will be looking at foot surgery because our steps will ultimately determine the direction of our lives. You may have sang this growing up in Sunday school, as I have. There is a song that has uh, great theology, but also very strong relevance for us today. And it is a song that goes, Oh, be careful, little feet, where you go. Oh, be careful, little feet, where you go. 
There's a father up above who's looking down in love. So be careful, little feet, where you go. All right, so you have heard it. This song sums up our passage for today. Oh, be careful, little feet, where you go. But that's not all. The great theology is there's a father up above who's looking down in love. The motive for this warning is one of love. So be careful, little feet, where you go. Why should we be careful with where our feet go? Because of this important life principle. Your direction will determine your destination. The direction that you head in, that will ultimately determine the destination of your life. Now, there's a warning though, and we can learn this warning from our geometry days, and that is the danger of a slight acute angle, right? Not an angle that is cute, but one that is acute, right? Uh, slightly smaller than 90 degrees, right? Because the acute angle, though we have a certain destination that we want to go in, and we head in that direction. But as long as we are heading in a straight direction, we're fine. But once we take a tangent, no matter how subtle it is, no matter how small that tangent is, the moment we begin on a tangent, in the beginning it doesn't seem like it's no big deal. We're still headed in the same general direction. But the longer you stay on that tangent, in the end, you will be far more distant from your original desired destination. So it teaches us the small steps are important. The small steps count in the end. In the beginning, it doesn't seem like it's a big deal. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to follow Christ, but you know what? I, I think I'll live here for a little bit. All my friends are doing it, and even, even my church friends are doing it. So I think that's all right. I'll, I'll live here for a bit. But those small steps that lead you on the tangent away from Christ will ultimately keep you away from Christ. It's important. Small choices count. Small steps count. 1 Corinthians 9.27, Paul says, But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others... I myself should be disqualified. Paul is saying, I need to make sure that I keep my life in check, my steps in check, so that I don't become disqualified in the end. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. He understands that each day, choices count. Our steps count. Paul also knows it is important because we do not coast all the way to heaven where all of a sudden we give our lives to Christ one day and we just sit back, relax, and we coast to our ultimate destination. He knows it isn't coasting. There is a role that we play. Are you and I headed in the right direction? So follow along with me in your outlines today as we explore this proverb, Proverbs chapter 7. And let's explore these steps that we need to take you are headed in the right direction when you stay intimate with God through his word. So everyone repeat, stay intimate with God through his word. Let's look at verse 1, Proverbs chapter 7, verse 1. It says, my son, keep my words and treasure up my commandments with you. So he is saying as a father speaking to his son. And in the parallel spiritually, there's a father up above who is looking down in love, saying these words. My son, keep my words and treasure up my commands within you. He's saying, my son, oh, my precious child that I love, I love you and I want the best for you. That is the heart of God for you. I love you. And I want the best for you. Therefore, he says, keep my word. Keep the word of God near you. Stay intimate with God through his word. And treasure up 
my commandments within you. He's saying, memorize the word of God. Hide these words in your heart to not sin against God. Why? Verse 2. Keep my commandments and live. It is life. Keep my teaching as the apple of your eye. Now, literally, verse 2 is saying, keep my teaching as the pupil of your eye. Right? Now, uh, the pupil is a very sensitive and important part of our body, of our eye. And the eye pupil is needed for illumination and guidance. Therefore, protect it. Protect this important part of your body because it will give you light and guidance. Just like we're naturally wired like that. If there's an object coming close to our eyes, we guard it, we protect it. Because the body understands the importance that it has. It will guard you. It will guide you. And so he's saying, keep the word as light and life within you. Verse 3, bind them on your fingers, write them on the tablet of your hearts. What is he saying? He's saying, find ways to keep it in front of you. Right? Bind it on your fingers. Have some sort of reminder in front of you. Find ways to keep the word of God always in front of you. And find ways to write them on the tablet of your hearts. And that means find ways to solidify the word in your life so that it will move from your head to your heart. Because just knowing it in your head will not do anything for you spiritually. How do I know that? Look at the Pharisees. If there is one group of people in the Bible that knew their Bible inside and out, they memorized tons of it, if not all of it, for some of these people. And yet, Jesus rebukes them and warns them that they are headed to hell. Just head knowledge will not change your life spiritually. We need to move the knowledge of our brain of Scripture so that it becomes a passion of our hearts and lived out of our lives. It must become intimately ingrained in our lives to know its passions and to feel its affections. So that when you read the Bible, you are feeling what the author is feeling when he is writing it. For example, some verses for you of scripture passages that resonate with people who are in love with the word of God. Psalm 119 72, the law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. Psalm 119, 162, I rejoice at your word like one who finds great spoil, like one you just found a million dollars. And for him, he's saying, it's more than that. What I find in your word, what resonates in my heart is something more great than that. Psalm 119, 127, I love your commandments above gold, above fine gold. Psalm 119, 103, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Job 23, 12, I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my portion of food. He is saying, I love the word of God more than my next meal. Jeremiah 15, 16, your words were found and I ate them and your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart for I am called by your name, O Lord, God of hosts. Because they understand how they were wired, how God made us. As Jesus declared, man does not live on bread alone but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. He knows that we are made to eat and consume the word of God. Feast on the word, people of God. Feast on it day and night. Memorize, read, study, vastly read chapters, digest and dissect verses. Consume it. Don't just eat crumbs and wonder why you're still hungry. You were made to have the depths of your soul find its nourishment and strength 
through the word of God. That is how you are wired. That is how God made you. Just as you will grow physically weaker as you skip more and more meals, you will grow spiritually weaker as you starve your soul of its proper nourishment. Amen? Feast on the word. Verse 4. Say to wisdom, you are my sister, and call insight your intimate friend. He is saying, make a verbal commitment. Say to wisdom. Speak it out. Make a verbal commitment out loud, just like in marriage vows. For that marriage to truly have significance and meaning, there must be verbal vows that are exchanged. Ways of expressing a desire and a commitment to that beloved, to keep wisdom close and intimate within our lives, to be able to say, I will pursue wisdom through the word. Now, what does it mean to say to wisdom, you are my sister? Calling someone sister or an intimate friend was a way of expressing innocent intimacy with someone. It is a desire of saying, I desire intimate yet innocent intimacy with this thing or person. And that is what the proverb is saying. Make a public declaration to desire intimacy with wisdom through the word. Why is this intimacy and determination towards wisdom needed? Verse 5, to keep you from the forbidden or unfaithful woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words. It says to keep you from the unfaithful and adulterous person. Now, it is interesting. The two people that we're looking at today is a single young man and a married woman. It is interesting that both are not single. One is married, one is not. Marriage does not lessen temptations. It only increases the consequences. Did you get that, all you single people out there? You might be like, Eddie, I am under so much temptation. If only I get married, I won't be tempted in this way anymore. And all the married people start laughing. (laughs) Marriage does not lessen the temptation. It only increases the consequences of when you give in to those temptations. To keep you from the forbidden women, from the adulteress with her smooth Words, oh Christian, be careful of smooth talkers. The smooth words of a player will trap you, but the sweet words of Scripture will set you free. So stay intimate with God through His Word, and it will protect you from the wrong path. Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Stay intimate with God through his word. Let the word of God so enwrap your life and your body and your days and your hours and your moments and your minutes so that it just is a natural, saturated surrounding for you, the word of God. Let me give you three practical things that could help you increase your Bible intake. Number one would be uh, the weekly memory verses. So again, I've mentioned this multiple times, but living life, I think one of the great things about having it is they have uh, weekly memory verse cards and also weekly memory verse reminders every day of uh, the devotional. Now, why do I keep stressing uh, Bible memory throughout these several messages this, uh, this year so far? Uh, I feel similar to what Dallas Willard expresses when he talks about Bible memorization. Dallas Willard says this, Bible memorization is absolutely fundamental to spiritual formation. If I had to choose between all the disciplines of the spiritual life, I would choose Bible memorization because it is a fundamental way of filling our mind with what it needs. This book of the law shall not depart out of our mouths. That's where you need it. How does it get in your mouth? By memorizing it. So we want to increase that. And a couple of other things that I want to help you with are podcasts that I discovered recently. 
Uh, another cool thing about Living Life is every day they also have a Bible in one year reading plan. So every day they'll give you the text. If you want to read the Bible in one year, uh, here's the text that you can read. And we follow through the uh, McShane Bible reading plan. And what's cool is I found a podcast recently through iTunes, and it's free. Uh, and so if you do a search on your program called ESV One Year Bible Reading Plan, and I think we have the slide for you there, that's what it looks like. They also use the McShane Bible Reading Plan, and it's parallel with this one. And so you can not only read it, you can hear those same four passages read to you every day as well. Uh, so if you follow the McShane, the cool thing about that is you read through the whole Old Testament once and the whole New Testament and the book of Psalms twice within one year, which is a great plan to do. And another podcast that I found recently, it's called You've Got the Time. You like that title? Right? That'll you know, prick your conscience, right? Uh, and that's the New Testament divided into 40 days. So if you want to do a search on iTunes, uh, ESV, you've got the time. Uh, so within 40 days, on average, about 30 minutes per day, uh, within 40 days, you will have heard or read through the whole New Testament. And so it's a great way, while you commute to and from work or wherever you travel, it's a great way to keep the Word of God in you on a broader scale. Amen? So I want to encourage you guys to take advantage of these amazing free resources well, living life's not free, uh, but it's very affordable. It's only 3001 right? That's like half price of a cup of coffee, right? Uh, and I think your soul will benefit far more than a cup of coffee. Amen? So stay intimate with God through His Word. That's the first vital step we need to take every day of our lives. Be intimate. Soak yourself. Surround yourself. With scripture. Next step that we see in this text is to stay far away from temptation. Everyone repeat, stay far away from temptation. Sorry about that. Let's try that again. Stay far away from temptation. I was trying to squeeze that in because I needed a drink of water. All right, verse 6. For at the window of my house, I looked out through my lattice, and I have seen among the simple, I have perceived among the youths, a young man lacking sense, lacking wisdom, lacking discernments. Verse 7 literally reads, I saw among the gullible. He's calling him a gull. I saw this gullible, foolish, unwise young man. It says, I saw among the gullible... And this refers to young men who do not make a commitment to wisdom before roaming their lives, before roaming the streets. The wise person will make the commitment. They will say to wisdom, you are my sister. They will say to the word of God, I need intimacy with you. But the foolish person, according to Proverbs, will not make such a commitment. That commitment will make you firm in your direction before wandering the city streets alone. Verse 8, passing along the street near her corner, taking the road to her house. Direction determines destination. And the best way to fight temptation, again, you need to first of all stay intimate with God through his word. But when you begin to make a tangent, when you begin to notice you're straying a little bit, that you're living this day of your life not grounded in the word, not guided by the word, the moment you begin to realize that you're not grounded in the word, you got to run back to the cross. The best way to fight temptation is to flee from it, to run away, to stay away from it. It's not about seeing how close you could get, right? Joseph, 
in Potiphar's house, when Potiphar's wife was luring and trying to seduce him, he ran away. If you don't want to fall, don't go to the edge. Just common sense, right? You don't want to say, let me see how spiritually strong I am, right? And so you run to the edge of the Grand Canyon. That's not smart. That's stupid. And also for some of us, there might be some areas of soul. You're like, I'm, I'm spiritually strong. I, I know there's some funky business over there, but you know what? I want to prove how spiritually strong I am. I'm going to go in these districts and, uh, you know, it's just a prayer walk. I'm just going to pray for these women. And uh, I'm going to be by myself, but that's okay. That is not a spiritual person. That is a foolish person, according to Proverbs. If you're fasting, stay out of the kitchen. <laughs> just practical advice. Amen? And for me, if there's chocolate in the house, I have to give it to my wife as soon as possible. Otherwise, it's going to show up here also as soon as possible. And I really do that. Because uh, when uh, in the past, when I was in Australia, uh, word got out that I really had a weakness, that I, I really loved chocolate. And um, people would give me so much chocolate. And I got so big at one point. And so my wife would have to hide it and eventually she would take it to work. And I'd be like, oh, what happened to those, like, two boxes of chocolate? She's like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> and she would give it away. And so now I've learned to appreciate that. And when people give it, I give it to her now. I might take one or two pieces, but then I'll give it to her. Take it to work. Keep it away. And then uh, if she forgets to take it to work one day, I'm like, oh, no. Because I know where it is. You know, I was like, I'm like, oh, I got I to gotta leave. I hear it calling me. I rebuke you! you know? And then the next day I make sure she takes it to work. Uh, but again, a practical principle. If you know something is going to be a weakness for you or lure you, it's not spiritual to see how close you could live with it. The wise person will cut it off and run away. Verse 9, in the twilight, in the evening, at the time of night and darkness... And now this is not only physical imagery, this is more of a spiritual imagery. Twilight is a dangerous time. It is a time when ambushers and adulterers begin their work. And this trap we fall into is one that is our trap when we don't walk in the light. Therefore, people of God, stay in the light. Do not play with things that you want to keep hidden. Stay in the light. And when you realize you're going off the mark, don't rationalize. You run back. You repent. And you plead for God's saving grace. Verse 10. And behold, the woman meets him. And so now we see the woman who is at hand, dressed as a prostitute, wily of heart, meaning she's crafty and cunning. Verse 11. She is loud and wayward. Her feet do not stay at home meaning she does not know where she should be rooted. It contrasts this with the wise woman of Proverbs 31, who knows she is to be rooted in her home and raise up her family and build her home. Verse 12, now in the streets, now in the market, and at every corner she lies in wait. This is reflecting her restlessness. This is imagery of restlessness. She is longing for love. She is longing for something. And she thinks she is longing for a man's embrace. She is restless because her heart has not found its rest in God. How do I know this? Verse 13 and 14. She seizes him and kisses him, and with bold face she says to him, I had to offer sacrifices, and today I have paid my vows. She is worshiping a false god of a false fertility religion, and it shows that she has not found the true God to meet the needs of the longings of her hearts. And what's interesting, one commentator said this about her aggressiveness, about how she is seducing him. Men use physical force to get women to submit, women use sensual seduction 
to get men to submit. Verse 15. So now I've come out to meet you, to seek you eagerly, and I have found you. Really? She's saying, oh, you know, I've been searching, wanting, and look, I found you. But where was the direction of that young man? She was headed towards her house. She was on the path. He was on the path to meet her. The book of Proverbs makes this clear. The wise person will find, seek and find wisdom. The foolish person will seek and find folly. Both will find what they were looking for. You will always find what your heart is really looking for, be it wisdom or folly. Amen? Verse 16, I have spread my couch with coverings, colored linens from Egyptian linen, meaning she's wealthy, or I should say her husband is wealthy. Verse 17, I perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Again, more sensory seduction. Verse 18, come, let us take our fill of love till morning. Let us delight ourselves with love. Now she's being a lot more direct what she wants to do. She wants to sleep with this guy. Verse 19, for my husband is not home. He has gone on a long journey. He has taken a bag full of money with him. And at full moon, he will come home. What is she doing? She is not only luring him. She's trying to make the young man feel safe. He it's safe. I know this is wrong. You know this is wrong. But you know it's safe. He's gone. He's far away. No one will find out. We won't get caught. That's what she is doing, reassuring him. And that's what causes him to give in. Now, there's a couple of things that I want to highlight as to why he gives in. And I think this is important for us to realize so that we can avoid this path. He gives in... First of all, number one, because he forgets the presence of God in his life. Unlike Joseph, when Potiphar's wife was trying to seduce him, he says, how can I sin against God, he says. He's living in the awareness of God. He forgets the presence of God. One of the greatest short books that you could ever read, a Christian classic, is by Brother Lawrence, and it's called Practice, The Practice of the Presence of God. If you haven't read it, it's worthwhile reading. If you have read it, it's worth, worthwhile reading again. And basically, he talks about learning to practice the conscious awareness that God is always with us. Now, this is something very important for us to realize. Normally, when we think, I gave in to sin or I gave in to temptation, we think that being alone is a bad place or a dangerous place, and it can be. But as believers, we need to radically redefine how we see our alone time. Not just as, oh, it's temptation time, oh, it's difficult time. There are two extreme possibilities in our lives when we are alone. One is the one we just talked about. We think, I'm alone. Satan knows my weakness. I'm a goner. And we think, Oh, well, I couldn't read this last time, so I'll just give in again. And that's how we envision alone time. But biblically, there's another, another radical worldview that we have to embrace of our alone time. And this I find through Matthew chapter 6, starting from verse 1. It says, be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men, right, to be seen by them. He talks about that. But then he goes, when you pray... Don't pray like hypocrites. Don't let it be known. He says, when you pray, pray in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret when you are alone will reward you. That is what Jesus says. And then he goes on to say, but also, you know what? When you fast, also don't make it obvious to people you're fasting, but be fasting in secret, in the secret place. And your father who sees what is done in secret when you are alone will reward you. He will bless you. There will be spiritual reward. But also when you give. Don't make it be known that you're giving. But when you give, give in secret. And your father who sees what is done in the secret place will reward you. 
Two great possibilities. We can even either give in to sin and regret, or we learn to understand that when we are alone, we are not alone. This is an opportunity, not for regret through sin, but reward through service to Him. Now, I love being with my wife. There's, I love, I mean, like when we took our break last month, it's like it was wonderful to spend 24-7 with her. But Mondays, when she goes to work, as sad as I am that we're not together, there's also a part of me that gets, uh, <laughs> I have to be careful now, right? <laughs> that gets uh, motivated <laughs> to embrace what I just talked about over here in Matthew 6 is that most of our time is with her, but now there is a time, a sacred time of aloneness where everything counts before God. What I do in the presence of God, everything there will be rewarded. Because Jesus is saying, even though you are alone, I am there. And when you realize I am there, and you pray to me, and you serve me, you worship me, that is such an amazing step of faith that honors my presence. When you are alone, I'm going to reward you big time in heaven for it. So instead of seeing alone time as, oh no, big temptation, see alone time as believers, this is reward time. I get to store up rewards as I fall on my knees and pray because I am alone between me and God. Amen? I want to encourage all of you, rack up mighty spiritual eternal rewards when you are alone. Amen? I really believe that's one of the reasons why he fell. He forgot the presence of God. Second reason why I believe he fell is because he had a lot of free time and he didn't know what to do with it. So he was just wandering. Hey, yeah, I'll check out that new place. I heard there's some interesting thing there, but, you know, I'm pretty strong, and I'll just see if there's a nice cafe next by. It has been said that empty time is the devil's playground. Therefore, people of God, serve God. Seek God with your free time. Make time to serve Him. Study the word of God and become a small group leader so you can use your free time during the weekday to prepare Bible lessons to help disciple other people. Amen? Don't just wander around every day. Live with purpose and direction for the things of God. How should a disciple's feet be used? Well, let's think of Romans when Paul says, how beautiful are the feats of those who bring good news. Oh, for all of you expats in this congregation, if you could see yourselves as missionaries in a different culture while you are here, and to realize that when you have plenty of free time, you use it to bring the gospel to this nation in places and to people that know him not. How radically different our rewards would be in heaven for our time spent in Korea. Verse 21, So with much seductive speech, she persuades him. With her smooth talk, she compels him. All at once he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter or as a stag is caught fast till an arrow pierces its liver as a bird rushes into a snare. He does not know that it will cost him his life. Scholar Bruce Walke puts it like this. Stupid animals see no connection between traps and death, right? You know, just animals in the wilds, oh, there's a net. 
Oh, you know, I'm a cow. And oh, my cow brother just went into that building and I never saw him again. Oh, it's my turn to go into that building. Right? Stupid animals see no connection between traps and death. Morally stupid people see no connection between their sin and death. The wise person knows the connection that the wages of sin is death. Why is this so important? Third point, because it's a matter of life and death. Everyone repeat, because it's a matter of life and death. Warning for all of us, Satan knows how to seduce us. And when we give in to seduction, it begins our destruction. J.R. Packer once said that there was once a time in Christianity where it was once common to hear Christian brothers and sisters talk about holiness and godliness with each other and their search and striving for it. People pursued it because people took seriously the words of Hebrews 12, for without holiness no one will see the Lord, and God's words, to be holy as I am holy. Now, he says, it is rarely discussed or sought after in our day of Christianity. Verse 24, And now, O sons, again, as a father to his children, this is the heart behind this passage. Now, O sons, listen to me. Be attentive to my, the words of my mouth. Let not your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her path. Again, your direction determines your destination. Saying, don't go there. For many a victim she has laid low and all her slain, all that she has killed, are a mighty throne. Saying your daily steps matter. They impact and influence the direction of your heart. Every great writer, every great artist, every great accomplishment was the product of daily discipline choices. Just like the Olympics that we just saw with Yuna Kim winning the gold. That was a product of daily discipline choices. To do certain things, practice, and to not do certain things, stay away from the chocolate. It was all a culmination to her destiny and destination. And those in prison also are there because of the steps that they took. They don't one day just wake up, ding, I'm in prison. Oh my goodness, how did that happen? The path that we walk on, the direction we head in, determines our destination. Verse 27, her house is the way to Sheol, the grave, going down to the chambers of death. He's saying, you know, her house isn't filled with bedrooms. Her house is filled with a battlefield for your soul. Compare that to verse 2. Look at verse 2 again. It says, keep my commandments and what? Live. Keep my commandments and you will live. It's saying, do you get the connection yet? That this path of God is the path of life. You will live. Take a tangent. That is death. Everything besides that is death. Destruction. There's only two options, heaven and hell, holiness and foolishness. Salvation will ultimately be seen not just in how we begin our faith journey, but how we persevere in faith and finish our race. I must plead to all of you today for your salvation, not just your sanctification, I am pleading for your souls to be saved based on the choices you make. In so doing, I remembering Paul writing to his little son in the faith, Timothy, in 1 Timothy 4.16, keep a close watch on yourself, your life, and your teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Yes, we're saved by grace through faith alone. I believe that with all my heart. But a sign 
of the saved is that they seek after holiness. Why? Because as a saved person, you understand that you are called to be the pure and spotless bride of Christ. Because as a saved person, you realize that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of God lives within you. Therefore, we do not want to grieve the Spirit. Do we care about these things? A sign of the saved is an increase. Yes, we will have our ups and downs. Yes, you, you may still fall into the same old sins from many years ago. But is there an increase of your hatred of your fallenness? Amen? That is the difference, people. Is there an increase, little by little, is there more of love for God this year than five years ago? Is there more of a hatred of sin this year more than five years ago? Or is it the same? Or is there absolutely no difference of your feelings towards sin and holiness? These are the words today from a father to a son. And it was meant to be taught in the family from one generation to another. Like Paul to his churches, 1 Thessalonians 2, 11 and 12. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. We need to hear this declared today because we don't hear it in our homes anymore. I exhort you, I encourage you, I charge you in the name of Jesus. Walk in a way that is worthy of the Lord Jesus. Live your life, make your choices, take your steps in a way that is worthy of the name that you bear of Jesus Christ. Walk each step you take in a way that would honor Him. Amen? Because there is a Father up above who is looking down in love. So be careful, little child, where you go. On just a practical level, I want to give you guys some uh, practical steps, next steps that you could take. First of all, the ABCs for you single people and... Uh, so ABC will be your outline for all you single people, and then DEF will be the outline of the marrieds, okay? So A, for all you single people, if you follow these steps, especially when you're in a dating situation, I assure you, uh, you will be able to either leave that relationship or enter marriage with far less regrets than most people. A stands for accountability. Everyone say accountability. Have accountability in your life. Why do we need it? Because light will drive away darkness. And we are weak and so easily deceive ourselves. And sneaking around, it's a sign that something's not right. So sneaking around from parents, from friends, whatever. And hidden sin is destructive. And we will become godlier with it. We will only benefit from it. As iron sharpens iron, Proverbs 27, 17 so one man sharpens another. Hebrews 10, 24, spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Charles Swindoll said, I know of nothing more effective for maintaining a pure heart and keeping one's life balanced and on target than being part of an accountability group. So accountability, I'm going to run through these quickly. B stands for boundaries. Everyone say boundaries. What are boundaries? A boundary is a property line. Henry Cloud, who wrote the book Boundaries, he says this, just as a physical fence marks out where your yard ends and your neighbor's begins, it distinguishes with what is your emotional and personal property and what belongs to someone else. Why do we have boundaries? They not only define who we are, but also it will protect us from harm of others. What kind of boundaries do we need? We need physical boundaries. Guard yourself physically. Stay pure. Remember, sex outside of marriage is sin. 
So do not give in, no matter how smooth they talk you into this topic. Do not commit sin, sex, outside of marriage. Amen? Your body belongs to you. Your body belongs to God. And your body belongs to your spouse. That's all. Amen? Also, you need spiritual boundaries. Protect your hearts so that you keep God as your first love in your heart. Number three, you need emotional boundaries. Guard your heart. Don't give your heart completely to someone before you are married. Your heart is God's and yours. It is not theirs until after marriage. So many times I talk with uh, people who are dating and they'll say they just met this person and then they spent like 12 hours talking on the phone and they told them everything as if they're bragging about how much they connected. I say that's very foolish. You've just given your whole heart to somebody and you just met them emotionally. And C, to have a healthy path of your relationships as you're single. C stands for Christian community. Everyone say Christian community. Learn to date in Christian community. Learn to be public with your relationship within Christian community. They must be a Christian, obviously, and you need community because the more time in isolation, the more time in temptation. Amen? You'll have plenty of time to be alone after you're married. Direction determines destination. And for now for the married people, D-E-F. D, devotions daily. Everyone repeat, devotions daily. Keep God at the center of your family by seeking Him together. E, enjoy life with your wife. Everyone repeat, enjoy life with your wife. Obviously, I'm talking to the guys here, Date regularly, at least monthly. Hopefully, you could date weekly. Let her know that you cherish her, just as men need continual reminders that they are respected. Wives need continual reminders that they are cherished. And then F. Well, actually, let's stay on that for a little bit. Uh, I think one of the principles that we could learn from this text in Proverbs and many other Proverbs is a safeguard of your life for the guys. And that is through this. Hold on to your wife to save your life. Don't embrace any other female. Right? Hold on to your life to save your wife. That's more than a rhyme. According to the Proverbs and according to wisdom of Scripture, that will save your soul. Amen? And then F... For all you uh, married people out there, F stands for faith and family first, then your work. That's the order. So everyone repeat, faith and family first, then your work. That's the order. Amen? Matthew 7, 13, I'll close with this verse. Everyone... Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. May you do whatever it takes to find that path and find that way. Jesus is that way. Let's pray. Let's pray right now, and first and foremost, we need to get right with God and say, God, have mercy on my soul for my adultery against you. Again, biblically, if we have been unfaithful to God, if you have not been the most faithful person to God, biblically, it's not, oh, I've been unfaithful. Biblically, we have committed spiritual adultery against God. And let us repent and return to God. Again, he is not angry. His arms aren't crossed and say, slobber, wail, groan. He is a father who is up above, who is looking upon your life in love. And let's return to him today. 
Let's pray right now and confess our unfaithfulness, our adultery. Physically, relationally, spiritually, whatever form it has come in, let us repent of those things today and return to the love of our souls. Let's pray together.